You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. It's Inside F1 with Joe Sayward. And I am joined by the man himself, the man who's been to every Grand Prix since 1949. It's Joe Sayward. Hello, Uncle Joe. Hello, I've been to every Grand Prix since 1949. That would make me very old because I'd have to be born in about 1929, which means I'd be nearly 100. Yep. I have a vague suspicion that is incorrect. I think telling people. I think you should go for it. I think you should shoot it, for a hundred. It might be true of 1989, 40 years after that, which just about hangs in with where I am age-wise. So yes, that would work. So <laughs> I, 89, get it right. In fact, 88 actually, Spanners. I thought the correct, the correct thing to have picked me up for there would have been that the first Grand Prix wasn't until 1950. Not true, isn't it? Oh no, my googling no, was first, wrong. The first World Championship Grand Prix was not until 1950. There were lots of Grand Prix before then. Oh really? Okay, so how did let well teach us? 1906 being the first. 1906, there was a Grand Prix, a Grand Prize. Where was yes, that? Yes, there was the Grand Prix de l'Automobile Club de France at Le Mans. And it was won by Ferenc Ziz, a Hungarian Frenchman riding a Renault. They used to say on Renault as opposed to in a Renault mm-hmm. in the old days because you were literally sitting on top of the machine. So, um, yes, it was Ferenc Ziz on Renault. And it was a very, very long, it was very, very long circuit too, about 100 and something kilometers. No wonder you're often described as an eminent historian, Joe. Well, you've got to be described as something. It's better than some of the things you've been described as recently. I'm I'm coming under fire. I am coming under fire for our last episode, but it's fine. I'd rather those people reveal themselves to me. Uh, but Joe, you're going to be in the fire of Singapore, in the hot, in the dark, in the weird time zone. What is it like for you and the teams doing such a kind of, you know, challenging on the the body and mind flyaway race? Uh, well, it's different for all of us because some people go there and they live on uh, European time, which is fine if you can do it. It means it means you sort of go to bed at two o'clock in the morning and you wake up at, at midday and then you have the race at sort of European time. However, people who travel a lot tend to be very um, attuned to climate and change yeah. and, and light and things like that because we have to be. Um, so it doesn't work for me because the minute it gets light, I wake up. So basically, I go to bed at about three o'clock in the morning and wake up at seven, which means that Singapore is usually just a place where I get no sleep at all <laughs> or very little sleep. And you don't get to go out and eat dinner because you're at the racetrack. And so you live off ice creams and sandwiches, which they are provided for by the very nice people at the Singapore Grand Prix, I should add. But you don't go and sort of you know, get your chopsticks out and right. um, and eat all those things that one eats in Singapore. Well, that's it. There was an interview with Kimi Raikkonen at a press conference when they said, oh, you must be so well-traveled, you've seen the world. And he went, I've seen airports and racetracks. Is that your experience as well? Uh-huh. Yeah. That is, well, up to a point it is, yeah. It depends if you if you make time and it depends how old you are. Um, you know, really your, what your commitments are. Racing drivers have always got to go off and sell washing powder or whatever it is they do. Um, and when I was younger, I would stay out a long time uh, between races. I'd go away for 10 weeks at a time and I would just cruise around and I'd do the tourism stuff in between. In those days, that was before the internet too. So you didn't have constant deadlines. Um, it was like sort of one deadline a week. So you'd do all your work and then you'd have the rest of the week to um, sort of mess about and prepare things and, and be a tourist. So it was a lot, uh, I wouldn't say easier in those days, um, but it was it was less intensive. I think that's the best way of putting it. But again, we didn't go to such exotic places, really. We only did about three or four. Um, yeah, three or four flyaways a year. We do Canada, Japan, Australia, and sometimes the US. But we didn't do it, anything much in Asia. We didn't do anything much in... We did Brazil, I suppose. Um, sometimes even Argentina and Mexico. I mean, things came in and went out. Came and went out, but generally speaking, it was a European Championship. Yeah, uh, sixteen races with about ten or eleven races in Europe. So we didn't go to Sochi or Baku or 
anywhere like that, or China even. But I did go to places like Macau, and I went racing in New Zealand and stuff like that. So it was, so I did. Yeah, I saw the world quite a lot when I was young. I, nowadays, it's true. You arrive, you leave. I've seen an awful lot of Saudi Arabia, which is taxi to the circuit. Right. I'm sorry, taxi from the airport to the hotel, airport, going back again, uh, hotel circuit four or five times. I actually haven't seen anything of that. Bahrain, I know a little better because we we had two races one time uh, in Bahrain in the same space. And so I went touring around and drove around uh, the island a bit and discovered all kinds of exciting places, some of which I think were pretty unwise places to be. But yeah, there you go. Going to be adventurous <laughs> occasionally. Yellow. Yeah. So yeah, when the when the odd opportunity has come up to like, do stuff with press people or like in an official capacity at the race. I've always kind of gone, hmm, it, you, you don't kind of get almost, you, 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 you don't get the full experience that you get at home. You're shuffled into a place. Then being sat in a press office doesn't always seem very glamorous. I, 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 in the olden days, you, the press office would have been some tables around a hay bale. But what, what do you actually get to see at most of the races? <laughs> when you first started, Joe, it would have been trestle tables around a hay bale. Not really, no. There were still, most of them had decent press offices or a few ropey ones, a few tents. Um, these days, they tend to be permanent structures. Not all of them. We were in a tent somewhere recently. I can't remember where it was. Um, and well, what do I get to see? Well, I don't sit around in the press office as much as some people do because my job, as I see it anyway, is to go and talk to people and find out what's going on. So I spend most of my time walking around the paddock drinking too much coffee and having sort of quiet chats behind behind the motorhomes and uh, finding out what's really going on. And uh, then towards the end of the weekend, sort of Saturday night onwards, I'm stuck in the press office banging away on the computer or in the hotel banging away on the computer. But basically, um, so people think you see me swanning around for two days, <laughs> sort of having a nice life and drinking coffee. And they think, what a lazy person. And then they don't see me at all for the next couple of days because I'm up to my neck in in producing the magazines mm -hmm. that people like to buy. Well, yeah, in theory. Yeah, like some to buy anyway. people go go and buy some GP, of them buy them even. You know, GP Plus magazine you can you can buy. So people want to ask you well, questions. G GP Plus and the JSBM newsletter, which of course, as you know, is a big fan of the JSBM newsletter. I do um, like it. Thanks, Joe. Tell the world how wonderful it is. You, you, the JSBM newsletter is expensive. But it's designed for professionals, really. But you do get, you do get an insight into the into the sort of the things that are coming through the pipeline a little bit earlier than they hit the broadsheets. Well, I like people who've signed deals that you don't know about about ten days after it happens. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. I got most of the IndyCar stuff right the other day, long before any of the American press did. I hope you noticed that. But um, I, I'm struggling to get motivated to watch IndyCar, if I'm honest. I, I think, because it's the last... I mean, me too, but yeah. I cover the news going on, and if you read the newsletter correctly, <laughs> Spanners, you will have seen that I named almost... I got one, I got one mm. of them wrong, but he changed his mind at the last minute, um, which is fair enough. You can't get everything right. But I was, I was very pleased with myself, because I had all the right people going to the right places. I even knew that Grosjean was leaving Andretti's. Nice. Um, and this was long before the Americans did it, so... You know, that's, this is what I try to do. I try to be ahead of the game. Hmm. You're very good at that, Joe. Should we get ahead of the, the listener questions? Much. I challenged the listeners to actually send a video a, a question, to send their question in the form of video. Now, Uncle Steve isn't going to like the way I do this, but I'm going to superimpose Toby Godfrey, uh, Godfrey over, over your head so that at least the people at home will be able to see him and, and hopefully you'll be able to hear this question, Joe. Three questions, Joe. Hi, Spanners. Hi, Toby. Toby. First of all, 2026, do you <laughs> think any particular team will have a advantage given what is at stake that year, what the regulations are going to be? There you go. And I don't know how much we know about the regulations, but it looks to be more than... I didn't hear any of that. Oh, did you? This is the first question. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you would hear that through the magic of technology. He is asking, does any particular team have an advantage for 2026? Uh, it's impossible to answer that question, really. I mean, you have you have the same basic big teams, but um, 
I suppose you can say the ones who have their own engine departments have the advantage because they can, if they can build a good engine, um, they can get it to fit with the car. But most teams, most of the big teams, they're all big teams, to be honest, nowadays. I mean, there's, there are very few what you would call small teams. Um, there's Haas and Sauber, I suppose. And Williams wants to be bigger. But most of the others are becoming... Now, they're becoming of the same kind of... Well, they're not of the same kind of level yet, but they will do over time. So it's very difficult to say who will come out ahead. Uh, a bit like in 2014, we didn't really know who was going to come out ahead. Well, you Lewis made, Hamilton um, obviously you, figured it out. You made some predictions, um, Joe, at the time, uh, you if know, I remember. Yeah, I probably, I probably did, but I honestly don't remember what they were. You said so, that Lewis Hamilton uh, was mad to go to Mercedes. That's right, I did. Yes, <laughs> and I thought he was at the time. But there you are. You see, it just goes to prove that even experts get things wrong occasionally. It or seems, supposed experts, it I should seems say. It seems obvious now, but at the time, it, it wasn't obvious that that was going to be such a, a blinding move. Not at all. No, it wasn't obvious at all, because they'd been a pretty pretty poor bunt for... In 2009, when they were brawn and they won the championship, that was that was terrific, but it was always, always a bit of a sort of a... Gosh, how did they do that? Well, they had something that nobody else had, and therefore they were quicker. Um, and then in 10, 11, 12, 13, they really weren't in the ball game at all, and Red Bull were jumping up and down on them. So when you get to 13 and you, you look ahead, you think, okay, who's going to come out ahead? Well, Mercedes did because they built a very good end, and they built very good chassis. And uh, until recently, that's what they were doing. Now they're still building very good engines, but the chassis aren't quite as good, for whatever reason that may be. Sorry, Joe, I had to run away. My cat... You're not supposed to leave in the middle. No, uh, you <laughs> didn't have to draw anyone's attention to that. I'd put you off screen, but my cat had dragged the green screen from one side of the room to the other, um, and nobody would have known if it wasn't for, for you, Joe. And uh, We've got some more questions. Just wants to be a star, clearly. A cat that wants to be on telly. What can you do? Honestly. Since, since you can't hear Toby, I won't do the rest of his um, his questions, but I will, I'll make that feature from now on that we can do um, video questions because I, I love the concept of that. So... Uh, let's see. We'll so long as no one wears silly hats, I agree with you. <laughs> we will stay away from Red Bull just for the mo just for the moment, Joe. Just to give ourselves some breathing space from the the feedback. Um, so, uh, what on earth asks Rachel is going on at Alpine since Otmar Schaffner departed? I've not really heard what's happening. Did I miss something? Does the team not know what's happening? I feel like Joe is bound to have some insights. Well, the team has made lots of changes and uh, uh, new people in different jobs. They've, uh, they've sort of reorganized it. And um, to be quite honest, we just have to wait and see what happens. Uh, they weren't very good at Monza, but Monza's never going to be a good track for them. Um, their engine is not very good, which is the fundamental problem. And I think another problem is that uh, the French end of the operation don't seem to want to recognize that the engine is not very good. And so there's a certain amount of tension between England and France. We also have a manufacturer um, involved in the team directly, which is never a good idea because manufacturers think they know all the answers and they don't. And so somebody will come along and kick out all the races and then think that it'll all work as things do in industry. Well, it doesn't work like that. So We'll have to see what happens, but I think they need leadership. They have Bruno Famine, who is the vice president of competition at Alpine. He's, it's his job to sort of run things. He's also the interim team principal. Or why, why you call him interim if you don't have another one is uh, not clear, but I suppose they're intending to find another one. The problem is there is no Ecole Nationale pour team principals. Um, you know, you have to go and find somebody who can do the job, and it's very difficult. And um, I thought it was rather unwise to get rid of Omar, but uh, Luca Di Meo, the boss of Renault, obviously disagrees with me. And as he hasn't been at a race since, I haven't vo voiced the subject with him. But I probably will when he does turn up and sort of say, what in the world are you doing to find out what it means? I thought actually they were doing something clever, which was going to put Benotto in there. That may not be the cleverest thing in the world, but it would have, been some it would have put somebody in who understood Modern, how the two yeah. sides worked. Um, and what you need to get to a certain level in Formula 1. And 
it would have put in an Italian who isn't either French or British. So it would be a sort of neutral figure in the ongoing battle between Britain and France, which is the Alpine team. Hmm. But Bonotto's come off the back of a failure. So that does that feel like that would feel like a step backwards? Yeah, but where Ferrari was and where they got to, even allowing for some dubious activities, um, was not bad. You know, to get them to to get Alpine to be not bad would be a good thing. They were sort of working at it, but ever since we had the changeover of the bosses at at Renault, we've had uh, a lot of changes which were not perhaps uh, the wisest thing to do. Mm. I mean, Cyril Abitable might talk too fast and in 37 different languages at the same time, but he was a jolly clever chap and he was doing okay. Then they had Marcin Budkowski, who's a clever bloke, uh, but they didn't give him the space to do. Then they got rid of both um, Abitable and uh, Budkowski, and then they got uh, Zafnauer in. Then they got rid of Zafnauer. So, you know, let's wait and see what they do next. But... Um, they, I think they need to understand that Formula One is rather harder than the car industry, although they don't think that way. Um, and if they want a good example of how not to do it, I suggest they go and read the history of Jaguar racing when the Ford Motor Company came in thinking, you know, all their wonderful arrogance that we are better than everybody. And you just waited for it all to go. And it just went worse to worse to worse. There were knives flying. There were, you know, literally the guillotine came out. And uh, in the end, they gave up and flogged thro- the whole thing to Red Bull who turned into something sensible. So, you know, this is something you can't teach automobile executives except by pain. And after mm. a while they learn that they learn from the pain that they are in fact foolish. And we could say the same about Toyota as well. They did almost exactly the same thing. If you want to throw a billion dollars away, just come to Formula One and try and run it like a car company. The problem is with uh, Cyril Abitable there, it felt like they had a great emperor to, to lead them forward. You know, it was, you, they were kind of synonymous, a beatable and, and Renault F1. But then since he's gone, it's like the, it's like the final days of Rome with emperors just being toppled left, right and center. And I guess I'm wondering in the team, do they, do they have any feeling of stability? Is it even worth getting to know a team principal at Alpine? Cause they'll be gone soon. Well, not necessarily if there's a good one. The trouble is that they didn't just get rid of, um, Zafnau, they also got rid of um, uh, Alan Permain, yes. who was the sporting yeah, yeah, yeah. director, and they they must have known it was coming as well. Their technical director, or their chief technical officer, rather, um, has left to go to Williams. It all happened at the same time. Now, you know, in, in the industry world, you'd say, oh, well, they're putting all the bad news in the same quarter, you know. So they put all their debts into the same thing. They have a terrible result for a while, then it looks better after that. Uh, that's not how it works in Formula One. So you, you've dumped everybody or let them leave or not been able to stop them leaving. Um, now you've got a whole bunch of new guys who aren't fully um, competent or yet. I'm not saying they're not competent, but they're not competent at it yet because it takes time and experience. So, you know, I think they are in a situation where they have to learn how to do it. Mm. And we'll see if they give them um, enough rope to do it or enough rope to hang themselves. You know, it's one of the two things. The other thing is that they've got this daft idea that you can do everything in a hundred races. Um where, you know, you might as well just load a revolver and put it against your head. Right. <laughs> and uh well it's true. It, it's just mad. I'm it's, just gonna it's, soften it's, that to with a, some jazz. To set, to set a deadline to set a deadline of a hundred races, which is five years effectively, slightly less, to be winning world championships and all the rest of it. You are living on cloud cuckoo land. So, you know, or in cloud cuckoo land, sorry. Um, so Mr. DeMeo needs to wake up and smell the coffee um, and figure out how to do it properly. He's very good at running car companies, uh, apparently. So we'll see. But you know, Alpine has big ambitions. Alpine, sorry. My, Alpine. My, uh, French people would complain if I say Alpine. Alpine has, um, has big ambitions of selling cars. And oh, right. In lots of ways, uh, Formula One is just a sideshow. It, it's, uh, it's a way of uh, showing the brand, but they don't want to be failing at it. Um, now, they're not really failing. It just so happens that you know they fired everybody at Belgium and, and Monza doesn't suit them. So let's go to Singapore and see how they do there. In fact, if I remember correctly, Gasly somehow or other ended up on the podium. Yeah. Um, not so very long ago, which was ironic to say the least. 
Um, but he did. And so, you know, all these, all the bad teams of Formula One are still decently good, with one or two exceptions who I won't name, but it's fairly obvious. Um, Salva. But has. I never said that. I can't believe you I'm just listing, a nasty thing I'm about I'm just Salva. listing names and looking for your reaction. Oh, that looked like a nod oh, okay. to me. Was that a nod? No, I don't think it was. No, um, it wasn't a nod. Isn't no. the problem with Alpine, though? Like, why are they being so ambitious? Why do they keep promising to lasso the moon? Why not just say, you know, we're, we're here for top five finishes? What, what they're trying if, to do... If you, think, if you think they're being ambitious, you need to look at... Their, outwardly. <laughs> their plans, their, their production plans for the Alpine models. Okay? Yes. Right now, they sell three and a half thousand cars a year. And by 2030, they want to sell 150,000 cars a year. So right. if you think they're being ambitious in Formula One, have a look in the real world. And, you know, there'll, there'll be Alpines going down the supermarket left, right and center if they can sell that many of them. Okay, but, but they're, you know, nowadays, all, they're, they're pure EV, aren't they? Well, yeah. yeah. What? what? Sorry. They're pure EV. It's not my fault. It's the internet's having to get to France and back. Um, yeah, it's all EVs, okay. isn't it? So they're, they're very much on the EV wagon early. Well, they're on the EV wagon, yeah. We'll see what happens in the long term. They're also they were also making lots of noise at one point about hydrogen, um, which is another alternative route. I think you need to hedge your bets. I think all these car companies let into electricity and just do electricity are being a little silly. But, you know, who am I? I'm just a Grand Prix reporter. What do I know about the car industry? <laughs> you know? It's too late. It's too late. Just just to put my opinion out there for the record, it's too late. EVs won. Yeah, hydrogen's a better map. Beta yeah, but max. nobody's buying the damn things. Yeah, they That's will. The they will. Um, and even if they do buy them, they can't recharge them because there are 37 people waiting for the three recharging machine. <laughs> yeah, but there wasn't petrol stations at one point. Do you know what I mean? They just got to build them, yeah. in it. Uh, well, there's tons more petrol stations that are recharging point. I'm but, sure uh, uh, no, in 18... I'm just thinking, I think, I think listen, it'll work fine if you live in Chiswick. And you pot around London in your in your EV thing, and you can find a parking space for it, which doesn't cost the same as a house. But um, out in the country, you know, look where you got to do stuff, and um, you know, take trailers along and stuff like that. You know, your battery's boring and it all falls apart, and there's no recharging point, and nobody's going to buy the damn thing. So let's see how it happens. Maybe maybe the electricity crowd are right, but maybe. There are other means that are better, yeah. uh, including, yeah. for example, in, including um, fuel that is entirely sustainable, which Formula One is now going to be working on in twenty six. Interesting. That is really interesting. I was so surprised that they've gone down this this route. I, yes, it makes Formula One sustainable, and they want to be completely carbon neutral by twenty thirty. I think, which is a great ambition. But I always thought the the point of, say, for example, going hybrid was road relevance. The road network is never going to be fueled by sustainable fuels. You'll never be able to make enough sustainable fuels for the entire road network. Why not? So why I'm not? So, well, where, know, where are we going to make them, Joe? Well, there, there are factories out there, and as they become more uh, accepted, and people realise that it yeah. will work, there will be more. I don't think it scales. It's true at the moment. There aren't many. Yeah. There aren't many of them. Yeah. Okay, so but, th that's my surprise. So, so F one in the, in the oh, old sorry, days, sorry. as you just said yourself, you know, in the old days <laughs> there weren't many refineries either, so you couldn't put crude oil in your machine and hope for it to go. So they used to use sort of you know, whale oil and stuff to power cars in the old days, didn't they, sir? Yeah, and the idea being that the carbon that is released from the sustainable fuels has been, you know, captured in the first place. So you're you're t you're 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 not releasing new carbon; you're sort of recycling carbon so the, so it becomes a kind of carbon neutral cycle um but yeah so they must think that it will scale there's up there's lots of there's lots of there's lots of problems with all the arguments at the moment they've all got ups and downs you know that even the 2030 sustainable thing in formula one doesn't include um spectators right you know how, how i've already i've had this argument already how can you have this not including spectators and they say well that's the race promoters who have to deal with that Formula One itself will be fully sustainable by 2030. Fair enough. Well, that doesn't make the sport as a whole sustainable, just Formula One. So it's kind of um, messing about. I did have an entirely brilliant uh, argument from the Mexican Grand Prix promoter a uh, year or so. I might be last year or the year before. I can't remember. He said, um, we don't have to worry about that. And I said, excuse me, how can you possibly argue that? And he said... We're already, we're already sustainable. 
And I said, how, how does that work? He said, well, when you televise Formula One, all over the world, millions of people stay at home to watch it uh. and don't go out driving. It's a brilliant <laughs> argument. It's a very, very good argument. Because you can't go, oh, that's a load of rubbish, because it's actually sort of true. But how do you measure it? That's another problem. But he is, you know, you can argue that, I suppose, that we stop people going out and going driving in the Cotswolds and pumping out lots of nasty fumes. But anyway, I'm not sure I'd argue that one, but it was certainly a good good effort. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, the average carbon right. footprint of anyone enjoying Formula One, I suppose, is, is actually pretty low. Yeah, I like that. Shall we move on, Joe? Shall we get another question here? <laughs> Please feel free because, you know, carbon stuff is really I my, my cup of it's tea. Just, look, know? people are going to email, and I don't mind, feedback at uh, spanners, sorry, feedback at mistapex.net or spanners at mistapex.net. I love that. I just like to caveat my view quickly so you don't go, hey, spanners, why didn't you challenge such and such on such and such? So I think EV is the way forward. Hydrogen's too explodey and sustainable fuels won't scale up to the road network. That's just my view. Joe seems to to disagree. Okay, so just just cutting off a couple of emails there, Joe. Uh, right, let's see. Who's, who did this question? This is Mark. Mark Greenhouse says, question for Joe. How much of the recent Williams success can be attributed to James Valls. Can he really have made such a big did, difference? Did you just say Mark Greenhouse? Greenhouse. Greenhow. Greenhow. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. I thought you said Greenhouse. Even so I was going to ask if there was any gas about. You know, was, if he, even if his name was Greenhouse, I don't think it's right to mock the listener's surname, Joseph. Unbelievable. I'm so well, sorry, people Mark. Use the call me C- people call me Seaweed all the time, so there you are. Yeah, you well, do? your name should be... Yeah, you pronounce your own name wrong, but we won't get into that. I literally have to write down S A Y W O O D to overcome how you say your name wrong. Name wrong, Joe Saywood. Right here we go. So has... I, bl- I blame the Danes. It's all their fault. So has James Vald ma- made such a big difference in such a short space of time, or is he just taking the credit for things that had happened before he got there? <laughs> James Vald has arrived. He has reinvigorated the place. He's moved people around. He's got rid of some of the silly ideas and silly thinking. And what they've got is a car that is now, it's not fully competitive, but in certain places it's very competitive. They also have an exceptional driver in uh, in Mr. Albon. And so I think you can give almost all the credit to, to, um, to James for nice. having done that. Obviously, the engineers built a half-decent car, but they didn't have the money to develop it um, before uh, the new owners came along. Um, but you know, you 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 do have to say that James is responsible for a lot of. It seems like he's sort of. And also, the most important <laughs> thing, the most important thing, is is the sense of we can do this within a team. People will follow James because he is he's a very good leader, and mm. that's you know you don't have the the apathy and the. Um, oh, well, you know, we don't have to do this because we're not fighting for a world championship kind of attitude that exists in some places. And that is, that's a huge thing. You know, people will go the extra mile because they think they can achieve stuff. And that's really important. That's down to good leadership. And, uh, and leadership is much more important in Formula One than people sometimes uh, give it credit for. I'll just point out to the listeners and viewers, by the way, we're not constantly talking over and interrupting each other for whatever reason the line between me and joe always seems to have just a little bit of a delay so we we, th- we think the other one stopped talking um because it has to go through joe's private stream it has to go over the deer enclosure and through the butterfly house before it gets to his house but the thing i've really noticed with williams is that procedurally everything seems perfect so i'm wondering whether you know you're right and you're saying you know james Vowles has gone in there and really taken like the low-hanging fruit procedurally their pit stops are on point in qualifying, they always seem to time their runs perfectly. Everything seems to just be running just so. It's not just it's not just James. Let's be fair here as well. That he has brought in a bunch of people. You haven't heard of lots of them, but they come in and they're very accomplished people. Not necessarily all from racing. I mean, they have a new uh, chief of operations who is a very accomplished man outside. The world of racing, but he's very competitive. He comes you know, from the aviation world, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and he's he's done a remarkable, or he's doing, or you know, to get to get parts arriving on time early 
you know, as fast as possible, get production up to speed, to get all kinds of things that Williams weren't doing right, correct. There's, there's not just James, but, you know, James has brought the people in and he's bringing in more. And Pat Fry from Alpine is a good example of that. Pat won't be designing the cars necessarily. I'm, I'm sure he won't be. But he will be putting in place what is necessary for the team to be successful in the future. And there are people coming in. It's what, What's really interesting is that is that you can see that Williams has ceased to be a place you wouldn't go to being a place where engineers are saying to each other, what do you think about William? And I think I should go there because that's, you know, that's the kind of place things are happening. So you'll see people coming out of Red Bull. You see people coming out of Mercedes, out of Ferrari. And they're going to Williams. Why is that? Because they think it's a team with a future. And, you know, if there's money behind it, they have a problem at the moment with CapEx, uh, capital expenditure investment, because the other teams, uh, <coughs> and FOM, which is weird, but... Um, the Formula One group seems to be in agreement with the bigger teams that um, you can't allow free reign on investment, although they have done, you know, with Aston Martin. Uh, to a large extent, that's had a huge amount of investment which was agreed upon. Williams it hasn't been allowed that advantage. Um, there's about four teams who want to go on investing and have the money to do so. Um, but you've got to have five to change the um, the, the limit uh, of capex over a period it's it's all very complicated but basically uh there is a desire for everyone to have the same basic um facilities which um would create a level playing field over time but that desire is also being blocked by people who have those facilities already and saying well why should the new why should new people have the advantage over us they're not new and that's the argument going on at the moment they're hardly new, are they, Williams? Yeah, it's not a, it's not like an Andretti yeah, coming up. The facilities are twenty <laughs> years behind. Yeah, so how, I yeah, think people yeah. need to realise just how off the pace the the factory, the wind tunnel. They need so much stuff changing. They need they need a hundred million, more than a hundred million of investment. Because since <clears throat> literally since uh, I don't know about two thousand and six, seven, something like that, the team hasn't had enough investment. Mm. And now they can't, which is ironic, really. But they, they, you know, they're, they're, everything's yeah. in place to go and do it again and build Williams up, but they're not allowed to invest. But they could underspend on the cost cap and use that money to invest if they wanted? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Well, if you understand, if you can underspend on the, on the budget cap, you're doing well. Um, but even so, you're still looking at, you know, they're, they're, you're looking at about $70 million that they... Uh, you can't run a racing team um, minus $70 million what your budget is today. You just can't. So they need to go on arguing. They will go on arguing. But the, the fundamental the philosoph the philosophical arguments of Formula One are that there should be a more level playing field with everybody having the same sort of stuff, and then you get better racing. That's the philosophy. But then you have the vested interests who say, well, hang on a minute. You know? So Ferrari, uh, Mercedes... Red Bull, they don't want... Red Bull's a bit different because they've got two teams and one of them needs investment, the other one doesn't so much. Then you have McLaren, who've pretty much got what they need, just haven't been using it very well. Um, then you've got uh, Sauber, which has got some of the stuff you need, but Audi's coming in and they want to invest more. So and then you have Alpine, which you know, I'm not quite sure where they're going on any day of the week. And... Um, <laughs> depending on who's in charge that week. And, you know, so you have these different elements. The ultimate best solution is, is, to, is to follow the NFL route, which is to, to, to make the week stronger um, so that everyone can compete and create a better show. And that's what everybody, everybody's constantly going about and we're not off racing. You know, this is what she's supposed to do. <laughs> that's a good impression you know, of everyone. Yeah, it is actually, isn't yeah. it? I mean, yeah. but it's that's what it is. There, hello, I'm a reader. Um, <laughs> I've been I've been plagued by that throughout my entire life. Um, of the hello, I'm a reader. I just like to complain syndrome. Um, everybody has things that are wrong uh, with with Formula One, but you know it takes a lot to change things. And while the media can help, um, the media needs to be a little bit more responsible to be taken seriously. 
and sometimes, particularly nowadays, when half the media actually isn't involved in the sport, um, it's much more difficult to have mm. a voice. That's interesting, that kind of feedback. That's the only feedback now that makes me genuinely sad is when somebody goes, oh, I've been listening for 47 years and I've loved every single show, but this one show, this one thing you said has outraged me, so I'm going to write to you for the first time. That's the only feedback that sends me sad. And I always go back going, how come you didn't write when you were enjoying all the other ones? That would have been a nicer email. Oh, come on. You don't want too much positive praise because then your Dude, ego would go through no, the roof and there'd be a I big hole where need... the rain would come in. I used to say this whenever we had a substitute uh, producer uh, on on the local radio station. The producer would come in and go, oh, hi, I'm Richard. I'm, I, I'm the presenter today. Um, just so you know, I need constant reassurance and validation. Thanks. And then I'd go on air and see their confused faces. <laughs> and they would sort of occasionally go on the little producer mic and be like, um, you're doing really well. It's all sounding great. And I'd be like, thank you. Thank you. I, I need that. <laughs> and I'd just get them to do that for a three-hour shift. Um, anyway. Uh, right. Now it's your turn to get yelled at, Joe. Okay, not by me. So this is a qu uh, question from Jell. I've made my opinion on this very clear, and you've all already sent me your email, so all I will be doing is reading this question and then asking the odd follow-up. Okay. Jell, uh, this is from Jell06, says, uh, What's the feeling at Red Bull? They've just had a very public mess-up that's not going away. Oh, yeah, blimey, the feedback has been incredible. Uh, what's been the fallout behind the scenes? Has this pushed Perez further away from the Red Bull seat? And if so, what are his options? Could we see him go and who would be brought in to replace him? Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at all the FIA Twitter posts, every reply for days was that was was about Helmut Marco. So, you know, have you got any feeling of, of how Red Bull have reacted to the kerfuffle? Well, you see, this is one of the things about social media. There are kerfuffles that have no impact at all on the real world. Everyone's in a big kerfuffle about it all. Helmut Marco, I'm absolutely sure, doesn't give a toss. Yep. Um, because they're winning the world championship by a million miles and they don't need Sergio Perez. Max Verstappen has actually won the Manufacturers Championship as well, if you look at the point standing. <laughs> oh, God. Um, Perez is merely a sort of bloke in the corner who sort of adds a few points occasionally, um, but never actually looks very good. So um, what do they do? Do they disrupt what they have um, and get excited by the social media or just go on winning races and saying, bye bye, nah, 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 for the rest of the world? So if I were them, I'd just go on winning races. Um, as to whether they can go on winning races in the future, it's another matter because everyone will build new cars, particularly in 26. Um, but is it best to, to disrupt the equilibrium that they have at Red Bull, which is very simple, as Max Verstappen and the bloke in the corner who can't drive fast? Or do you have somebody who can drive a bit faster? And so Max starts looking over his shoulder. I don't think Max would look over his shoulder at anybody, to be honest, because... I think he's he's pretty clear in his own mind that, mm. that he's he's pretty damn fast. So, you know, what's the point? If you look at McLaren back in the 80s, they, they put Senna and Prost together. A duh. How'd that go, Uncle that Joe? That wasn't smart. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is, you know, that's one of the things you have to think about. Is it is it wise? It's sporting, yeah? It's It's more sporting, if you like to call it that, to have two guys fighting it out with the same car, particularly if your car is dominant. So... Then you get to the situation with uh, Rosberg, Nico, Variety, and uh, Lewis, where they were sort of fighting it out for the championship. So you have interest for the fans. That's one way of looking at it. Um, if they want to go down that path, they're very, very keen on Lando Norris, which is interesting. There you go. That's um, I've heard question. several Red people, well, Red Bull people saying they're interested, and Lando saying he's interested, even if he goes up against Max, um, which I think is really interesting. It tells me a couple of things. One is that Lando is not necessarily convinced that the future lies at McLaren. He also knows that Oscar Piastri, after nine months in Formula One, looks good, didn't he? Is already is already making him, you know, sort of all work quite hard. So, and this is Oscar's first year. You remember, he's trying to learn about the tires and the tracks and all this stuff. So, Oscar's doing a really good job, and I think he's got under Lando's skin just a little bit. Lando just doesn't seem to be very relaxed about it all and so i think if i was lando um i might start looking around unfortunately lando signed a contract that keeps him there until the end of 25 so if he wants to go somewhere he has to um he has to buy his way out of his contract assuming that mclaren have got all the contractual details correct which may or may not be the case given the palau story which we don't know the details of but 
Palau mm. seemed to think he could walk out. So, mm. And you won't normally do that if there's a legal thing binding you there, will you? God. But the thing is, if you ask Lando Norris, would you go up against Verstappen? He's not going to go, in a Red Bull, you're joking, mate. No. So he's got to say. No, he, 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 has, actually, he has actually responded to that. He has basically said, well, you know, if you're going to try to be the best, you've got to measure yourself against the best. Mm, if I a, fail, I fail. Mm, there's a flaw in that. No, no, though. but that's that's what you have to do. No, there isn't. There is. Oh, can I can Otherwise, I can I offer a flaw? Away. Can I offer a flaw? The flaw is that you I think offer a flaw, yeah. there are there are some drivers who could take on Verstappen in a McLaren or an Audi or a Mercedes. I don't think there's anybody who goes up against Verstappen in a Red Bull. Why? Because he's there. He's their he's, Schumacher. He's, 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 you, yeah, but you, yeah, that 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 implies that that Red Bull favours. They Verstappen. do absolutely hundred percent. They don't favour Verstappen. Verstappen's just the best driver. I don't so believe you. Any team, any team will naturally, psychologically fall behind the best driver, even if they don't officially, whatever. If somebody comes in and goes faster, so for example, let's go back to the example of. McLaren in the 80s. Alain Prost was there, Senna arrived, and guess what? By the end of the time there, Senna was very popular and Prost had departed. So, you know, it's not it's not about one favoring the other. Mm. It's about people going and challenging themselves against the best. And that's what, as a racing driver, you have to do. Otherwise, you're just running away and earning money. Now, how many of them get the opportunity to measure themselves up against the best is another question. But when you do have that opportunity, if Red Bull has said to Lando Norris, we want you and we'll pay you this amount, why wouldn't you do it? Well, Norris will go there and get spanked by Verstappen. 100%. Not necessarily. Okay, so... No, no, but do, hang on. Hang on. Rewind a bit. Go back in time. Lando Norris and yep. Max Verstappen have been around racing together. I'm not sure how much they've actually raced together um, head to head at the different levels. But, but, you know, they both have great ability and they both know one another's uh, skills and weaknesses. The only way you can find out if one's better than the other is to put them together. That's the only way that you can judge who's a better driver. And then even when you can judge that, you have to base it on the fact that in the first year in a new team, a guy will usually not be as quick as the guy who was there before. So, you know, we have to see um, how how things develop. And this is why it's very it's so difficult to judge who's the best driver. Because you can say, well, he beat him and he beat him and he beat him. Therefore, he is better than him. That doesn't take into account the fact that one might have got better and developed more than True. the other over time. But Max has brushed everyone based aside. On the, yeah. Based on the cars, based on the cars they have, because cars also help. They give you confidence. Therefore, you, as you get confidence, you can do stuff you can't do in other cars. So you learn more. So Max has brushed everyone aside, pretty much, once he sort of found his feet. He looks much better than Ricardo, yes. Gasly, Albon, all fancy drivers, uh, Perez, who'd won... Yeah, he's won nine races and got nine podiums from the midfield, making him look absolutely disastrous. So that must mean that either he has some advantage at Red Bull or the Red Bull favours him and his style or whatever, uh, or he is just in a, a, a league of his own over all of those other fancied drivers and there's just no one that can touch Max Verstappen at the moment, which would not well, say much looks, about the state looks, of talent in F1. It looks that way, but let's look at it another way. How many of those drivers you've mentioned? Daniel Ricciardo had had the time. He was there when Max arrived. So uh, he did look good in the first year against Max. Then Max looked good in the second Un year. Unreliability and then was an left. issue, though. Hang on. Yeah. Right, but da Daniel left also after that because he realized, holy cow, this bloke's better than me, probably. Mm. Yeah. Now, then you have the ones who followed that. Gasly thrown in too early. Albon thrown in too early. And naturally... To a lesser or greater extent, they failed or didn't fail. I, mean, I don't think Albon did a bad job, but it just so happened that when they were deciding what to do about Albon, he'd just been booted off by Lewis in Brazil and, and deprived of his victory, his first victory. Yeah. And Perez had lucked into a victory in a, in a racing point, in, in, a, in a race in Bahrain that honestly George Russell should have won at his first attempt in a Mercedes. So, you know, that's one thing I would say about Helmut, and that is he blows with the wind. You know, so 
If somebody looks cool one week, he'll yeah. sign them and then he'll regret it later. He doesn't think things through in, in a long term wise, in, in perhaps the way you should. So I I think you just have to you just have to put them together and see what happens. Perez is not a bad racer. This is the, the point about Sergio, is that his shockingly poor results come from the fact that he qualifies really badly. And, you know, how many times has he not made it out of Q3? Mm. Sorry, Q1, rather. Yeah, too many. Now, this year, he's been disastrous, so he spends his entire races catching up, which he does quite well, working his way through and avoiding getting you know taken out by people crashing into him and stuff like that. But you are you are at a massive disadvantage if you can't qualify. And that has always been his weakness. And it's not going to go away because, you know, and Red Bull can't afford to have him. They want somebody on the front row alongside Max all the time. All right. Okay, so the question, uh, well, actually we did get this question from uh, Gig and Nee as well in our Patreon Slack group um, about the Lando rumblings. If he goes to, to Red Bull, a surprise move next season, let's say, what what do you fancy? By by six months in, does he have the measure of Verstappen? Well, it won't happen next year. Uh, I'd be amazed if it did, because that means that, that Lando would have to buy out two years of contract, oh, yeah, good point. which is a lot of money. Um, and if anyone who thinks Red Bull is going to buy him out, they're dreaming because that isn't going to happen. So if he wants to get out, he'll buy himself out and then earn the money back, which is a tough way to do it. So I think he'll stay where he is next year. And I think that Perez will get booted out at the end of next year. And I think that then, or before then, obviously, because they have to make decisions, Lando has to decide whether to buy himself out of a McLaren contract for 25. Mm. And then, come on, Joe. Come on. Come on. It's a hypothetical. Oh, well, how would he do? You know what I think will happen. Yeah, how would he do? Well, I think I think that Lando will be, will be his usual quick self, but Max will be quicker to begin yeah, with. Agree. And then we'll see. I don't know what happens after that. It is genuinely possible that there's just a huge gulf in F1 between the talent and that you've just got, you know, the likes of Verstappen and Hamilton in, in one tier and then a gulf down to these drivers who we think are great, but really there's just a little bit of a of a gap. You know, it happened in Snooker, the generation. Well, I, I think the answer I think the answer is that they're all quick. They're mm. all quick. But some make more mistakes than others. If you look at Leclerc, Leclerc's incredibly quick. He makes a lot of mistakes, Maybe, perhaps because he's pushing the machinery faster than it will go. But nonetheless, he makes a lot of mistakes, and you can't afford to do that. Carlos Sainz is quick. He makes a lot of mistakes too. Although his finishing record, oddly, uh, has been remarkable over time. Um, so you have people who are fast, but being fast is... You've also got to be able to handle the pressure. And this is why... I think, for example, Piastri is remarkable because he's just not phased by anything. If he has a bad weekend, he has a bad weekend, shrugs and gets on with it. You know, it'll be better next time. Some of them, their their, their heads go down. Um, and they are they get depressed. They they double guess themselves and they lose pace because they're losing confidence. And so, it's a psychological game. Ultimately, mm. it's a psychology. And Max is just sailing along at the front. He's got the ability. He's got the, he's got everything right. And keep it running as long as possible. Interesting, because one of those is, and as a Lewis Hamilton fan, you kind of watch Lewis Hamilton's demeanor on a Friday. It's a big actual uh, indicator of his performance. And it's it's too it happens too often to be coincidence that he's down and then has a poor weekend. You have to think that some of that is psychological, like he talks himself out of a good weekend sometimes. So as Hamilton fans, you know, we, we look at his demeanour and if he's bouncy and happy, you go, oh, okay, that's that's a positive sign for the weekend. Um, Not really a question. I was just, just chats, really. Nah, um, I don't really agree with that no, either. I think oh, okay. Lewis always does, Lewis does as well as he can. Okay, his body language might do stuff, um, but... You know, he's always he's always giving absolutely everything. Lewis Hamilton's not a guy who gives up. You know, and he's you know he's he has to work for it too because George Hamilton, George Hamilton, <laughs> somebody else, isn't he? George Russell is is no slouch. So, you know, um, Lewis has to stay honest, and obviously the Mercedes team thinks he's still got it despite his advancing years. Um, they think he's still worth another two year contract. So why not? 
Why not? Uh, Ross has a question, probably to finish off, Joe, being respectful of your, your time. But for people who would like a bit more one-on-one -on -one time with you, or, or well, 50-on-one time, you are going to be hosting a virtual live audience, uh, who, you know, facilitated here by, by Mr. Apex, and I'll be, your, I'll be your MC as usual. It will be at 8 o'clock on Monday after the Singapore Grand Prix. So 8 p.m. on the Monday after the Singapore Grand Prix. You can buy a ticket for that live audience with Joe and the content is dictated by your questions. But for you, Joe, you will be on European time in Singapore, but it will actually be three o'clock in the morning for you. So I am looking forward to a hopefully vinoed up, uh, d delirious and, uh, and, and very freely liberal speaking Joe. Yeah, well, the thing is that people... Actually, it's quite a good a good idea to do that <laughs> because then you'll see that at three o'clock in the morning, um, I'm working at three o'clock in the morning quite often, so it's not a problem for me to do it. I mean, it will be the third consecutive night I'll have been working quite late. <laughs> yeah. So I might be a little bit normal. That's that's the one. That's but, what you want. That's what that's the Joe you want when you're asking questions because he forgets that. That's you know. true, but then the following day I've got to do the same thing again because I've got to be on a flight, flight to Japan at some unearthly hour of the morning. <laughs> um, so I won't actually get any sleep until about Thursday um, well, when we'll, I'm in Japan. Well, we'll put some links for that for the show notes uh, in the show notes for that live audience or follow Joe's uh, publications where I'm sure he'll publish details as well. Speaking of your publications, th this last question uh, features that. Ross says, in Joe's recent publications... He seemed certain that an Andretti Cadillac team would fail if admitted to the grid. Why does he feel that way? And if not Andretti Cadillac, <laughs> what American team manufacturer or factor or fan manufacturers could succeed in Formula One? Why have you written them off, Joe? Well, because I think they don't have a realistic view of what it takes to be successful in Formula One. And... Um, that may, be, harsh. Uh, may, may appear to be unkind. No, it's not harsh. It's just that people racing in for, in America don't have a clue what it takes to be successful in Formula One. They're all the same. <laughs> okay, I mean, that does no, no, sound back in, the, back in the 70s. Back in the 70s, oh, okay. they could turn up over here and, and do it. But not nowadays. Nowadays, it is an industrial effort. And if you think you can build cars in America and fly them across to places all over the world and you're going to be successful, you are dreaming. Secondly, they don't have a relationship with Cadillac that is that is contractually solid. In other words, Cadillac have not said they'll build an engine for definite. If Cadillac is going to come into Formula One to build their own engine, my view would be, if you sit down and think about it, why in the name of God would you go with Andretti to start with? It's insane. You'd go with a team because that takes out all the risk because you at least will know where you stand with a team that's that's tried and tested. You'd much much wiser to go with McLaren and, and to find out where you are in the pecking order than go with a new team where you don't know what's wrong. So I don't see why Cadillac would go with Andretti apart from obviously branding, marketing, etc. But I think that they have a a, a a naive view of Formula One. And I think that the last thing that anybody wants, the last thing that Formula One needs is an American team that fails. And actually, Formula One group, I would argue, is trying to protect Andretti from itself. Now, they may not agree with that, and I'm sure Andretti wouldn't agree with that because they have this, you know, this set view that we can do it. Well, you know, good luck with that. But I don't think you'll be given the chance to do it because I think Formula One needs to protect itself as well. Because what we don't need is to have a weakling team that will take five years at least mm. to get up to the level required. And um, it doesn't need it. If Michael and co. want to come into Formula One, really, it's still the best way of doing it is to buy a team. I know it's difficult to buy a team and it's expensive. But in the overall scheme of things, it's probably no more expensive than trying to do it. Um, the hard way. Who, and who, who okay, can... you have to make compromises. You don't have things how you want them to be. But it's it's really not easy. And I, I think that people who think it is easy, like Alpine, Toyota, etc., you know, there's a lot of people who've made that mistake in the past. And I think that Andretti is another yeah. one that could do the same mistake. A couple of follow-ups here from the, the live chat. Firstly, just to clear up, wasn't, wasn't Cadillac 
they're not doing their own en engine at first. They are just rebadging an Alpine to start with, right? Right, okay, there's that. Um, Lewis points but out if that... They do, if they're doing their own engine in the future, they need to start declaring it now because they have a... You know, there's there's yeah. a there's a lead in time. They can't do it now before 27 um, because you have restrictions on what you can do if you declare you're coming in. So from a, a, a engine manufacturer point of view, isn't that just a little silly and embarrassing just to just to slap your name on a Renault? Uh, I don't get it, but look at Honda oh. and Aston Martin. I don't get that either. You know, but at least Honda is an experienced Formula One team. Sorry, what what does Honda and Aston Martin have in common? Nothing. Do they sell <laughs> any product together? No. Are they the same level of panache? No. So what the hell are they doing together? It's called a marriage of convenience. Yep. And uh, that's all it is. So, you know, at the end of the day, who knows what will happen. Um, but I think it would be wisest for Andretti and co just to sit back, take a deep breath and wait for a team to go on the market. Because one will eventually. When Audi get um, bored of, of pretending to be Sauber. No, it could be before then. It could be, it could be you know... It could be an Audi situation. McLaren could implode because it could implode. Um, you know, Williams could go wrong. There's lots of things. Uh, Alpha Tori, Red Bull could get fed up with Alpha Tori. Or, yep. or Aston Martin. You know, Aston Martin's an obvious likelihood because it's really team stroll, isn't it? So I was assured, you know, Joe, I was assured sure. that, that the, the fact that Lawrence Stroll is in there is only slightly coincidentally because Lance Stroll is in and that he's got genuine passion and it's not really just about Lance. Yeah, and in the meantime, uh, he likes burning money too. Did he say that? Whoever it was who was telling you this? Yeah. Listen, that's the team, that is Team Stroll and the Aston Martin thing is a good way to try and make some money on the back of it. It's not working <laughs> at the moment. It might work in the future, and good for them if it does. But um, the question of whether Lance Stroll is good enough to be in a in the top team is another issue. Well, I think we will cut our losses there. We will thank the French internet gods for what they have provided thus far. Go and follow Joe at Joe Sayward on Twitter. We'll put links to his publications because he does the best post-race uh, travel log style review of the weekend which is your green notebook and also you do a gp plus magazine which is not just what happened in the race there's great features in there as well you subscribe to a whole year at a time and it's a steal how much is a whole year of gp plus magazine these days 39.99 it's and that's an for the whole season. giveaway that's for the whole season so yeah. you'll get the back catalog of, of pdfs as well if you order them now from the whole season i'm i'm, I'm quite a good salesman here i think i'm doing well uh, no, but you've missed out the most you missed out tsbm as well you know the so, newsletter that we talked which is about a weekly earlier. newsletter that tells you all the good stuff that's going to happen <laughs> and analyzes the stuff that is happening at the same time that costs more money as spanners has rightly said but you no know, you want to go down the pub and really dazzle your friends, this is the one to get. That's the one where actually I try, because I try not to use that information on the on the show. And I go, where did I hear that from? Oh, yeah, that was on Joe's newsletter. So I don't want to, like, try and break things for you, if you like. But um, the, the the live audience is an opportunity to hang out with me and Uncle Joe over Zoom. I, we usually limit to it to about 50 or 55 people. Um, so come and, come, and, come and ask Joe uh, a question, and it's run and dictated by your input so if it's rubbish it's it's their fault joe it's not our fault if it's if it's rubbish but it never has been we always it's get rubbish spanners it's never rubbish it's as close to the the in-person experience as you could get and we've always had really really good feedback from that so um get your ticket for that now uh, joe thank you very much for your time i will leave you to prepare for the flight to singapore and until we see you next work hard be kind and have fun. This was Inside F1 with Joe Sayward and Missed Apex Podcast.